Tonight we're going to be covering a fair bit of ground, actually, um, and so you bear with me. It's not been an easy presentation to prepare at all, actually, um, and it's taken me quite some time. And, and uh, yeah, looking at some things which are not quite pleasant to look at at times. But um, we're going to go through it, and um, the talk is exposing the fruit of evolution. It's part two, and obviously there was a part one, and probably some of you, and I guess definitely some of you weren't here for the first part. So what I'm going to do is just very briefly go through the first part, which was exposing the roots of evolution. And, um, but before we do that, I always do this right at the beginning, a definition of evolution, so we know we're batting on the same wicket. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary says it's the origination of living things by development from earlier forms, not by special creation. Um, and my understanding is adaptation, natural selection are scientific principles, uh, testable, but evolution is not. Adaptation, for example, people have quoted things like peppered moths or uh, Darwin's uh, finch beaks or something like that. Um, but evolution, as I mentioned in the first part, I traced it right through as a philosophical route. And uh, certainly Sir Karl Popper uh, referred to it as a metaphysical research program. So Karl Popper, by the way, was a, a very, very well-known uh, leading philosopher, an Austrian uh, chap. So let's just recap on the first part of the talk I did um, a few weeks ago, which was expose, exposing the roots of evolution. And I referred to Charles Darwin's uh, sixth edition of Origin of Species in 1888, and he lists in, in the, the preface there uh, about others that had gone before him. You see, you see, the thing was that Charles Darwin, when he wrote his original in 1859, um, others had already been thinking about and writing about and lecturing about evolutionary ideas before him. But I guess there was pressure on him, so when he came to the sixth edition, he gave credit where credit was due. So he listed about 22 people before him, uh, including... Um, Aristotle, he mentions there, and the footnotes also connected with Empedocles. So there he says, passing over the allusions to the subject in classical writers. Well, last time I spoke, I, I made a beeline for the classical writers and tracing back something of the ancient philosophy of evolution a long time before Charles Darwin. So we went, and it was a quite a shock to some people, about Brahmin uh, thinking, philosophical ideas in India, some 3,000 years or so before uh, Charles Darwin. And the quotation here from a Mahabharata, which says these, that is the creative processes, this is the whole process of, of the universe and everything else coming to being, in succession require, acquire the attributes of the immediately preceding ones from which they have originated. Each has not only its own special attribute, but each succeeding one has the attributes of all the previous ones. I showed a number of references uh, of some of the Hindu writings, but if you want to look at it in more detail, because I'm only whizzing through this, then please have a look on Edinburgh Creation uh, website and you'll see the full talk. Then I passed through from uh, the evidence linking from the Hindu Brahmins, Pythagoras, who was influenced by Egyptians, Babylonians and others, including the Brahmins, and many of his ideas came through um, the Brahmin understanding. Um, a form of pantheistic evolution. They had an understanding of reincarnation, which is quite different because obviously the soul leaves the body and comes back into another, another creature or so on. But they had this upward tree of life, as I spoke about last time, which from the beginning was this evolving process. On the other hand, a contemporary of Pythagoras was Thales, uh, who he branched out, instead of pantheistic, meaning God is the universe, is a consciousness and everything, uh, Thales instead was a naturalistic Evolutionist. He said basically everything came through entirely natural processes. And there were a whole lot of people like Democritus and Epicurus and others that came through that line. I went on to Plato um, in Timaeus. He said, these are the principles on which living creatures change and have changed into one another, the transformation depending on the loss or gain of understanding or folly. Well, that was not quite the understanding we have today. But nevertheless, he was talking about transformation of creatures from a lower to a higher form. And then there was Aristotle, more of a fixed understanding. Uh, but Plato and Aristotle, their, their understanding was debated and worked through right through the Middle Ages, through to the Enlightenment time. Quotation from Voltaire, 
when I first read Plato and came upon this gradation of beings which rises from the lightest atom to the supreme being, I was struck with admiration. A uh, big debate in France and in Britain and other parts of Europe. I mentioned Lord Monboddo, James Burnett, who was here in Edinburgh, um, and he spoke about, uh, even back in 1768 in fact, he spoke about uh, the orangutan being um, as an animal betwixt a monkey and a man, and he spoke about almost anticipating Heichel's uh, recapitulation theory um, in the womb. And then he had an influence on Erasmus Darwin. Both of them were, were Freemasons at the oldest Masonic Lodge here in Edinburgh. And Erasmus Darwin wrote two books, Zoonomia and Temple of Nature, which had a big influence on a lot of people in the Enlightenment period. And again, were free runners for uh, his grandfather, his grandson rather, Charles Darwin. Interestingly enough, Charles Darwin doesn't give credit to either Lord Monboddo or Erasmus Darwin, um, probably because of some of their spiritual beliefs they had with it too. Well, let's now move on to the talk we are uh, addressing this evening. The Fruits of Evolution... Uh, part two, that's what we're looking at. And we're looking at particularly three aspects. And in fact, uh, I think probably I could have done another talk on the third one, the sexual revolution, but we'll try our best. Eugenics, ethnic cleansing, and the sexual revolution. So let's move, first of all, to eugenics. And what is eugenics? Well, it basically means um, that it's well-being, translated you genes, it's, it's well-being or well offspring, uh, trying to produce well or good offspring. And um, interesting enough, we had this quite recently, um, I think it was last week or a couple of weeks ago, in the Independent, I don't know whether you were following all the furore caused at the time by uh, something which um, Dr. James Watson, who, he was one of the chaps that cracked DNA code back in the 50s with Crick, um, and he was saying, basically, this is summed up, this is independent, Africans are less intelligent than Westerners, says DNA Pioneer. Uh, and it says at the bottom there, fury over scientist theory, all our social policies are based on the fact that uh, their intelligence is the same as ours, whereas all the testing says not really. Now that caused a big stink, and in fact I think he was due to speak here in Edinburgh, but it was cancelled because uh, of people who were very upset about what they thought were racist remarks and so on, and uh, even harbouring back to the time of eugenics, which is going to be our main subject uh, or tonight. Uh, interesting enough, Dr Crick, uh, his colleague in the DNA work back in the 50s, he, well, he wrote in, wrote in, he said in 1978, no newborn infant should be declared human until it has passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowment, and that if it fails these tests, it forfeits its right to live. Interesting enough, it's actually not new. Uh, maybe the, the, the complexity of DNA and genetic understanding is, but the, the, the philosophy is not. Now here's a quotation straight from Plato's Republic. We must, if we are to be consistent, and if we are to have a real pedigree heard, make the best of our men with the best of our women as often as possible, and the inferior men with the inferior women as seldom as possible, and bring up only the offspring of the best. And, but, and no one but the rulers must know what is happening, if we are to avoid dissension in our guardian herd. And we shall have to devise an ingenious system of drawing lots, so that our inferior guardians can, at each mating festival, blame the lot and not the rulers. Our rulers will have to employ a great deal of fiction and deceit for the benefit of their subjects. Each generation of children will be taken by officers appointed for the purpose who may be men or women or both, for men and women will, of course, be equally eligible for office. These officers will take the children of the better guardians to a nursery and put them in charge of nurses living in a separate part of the city, obviously when they're grown up, not, not as babies. Um, the children of the inferior guardians and any defective offspring of the others will be quietly and secretly disposed of. They must be, if we are to keep our guardian stock pure. And I said that was from Plato's Republic, um, 375 BC. And as I mentioned before, Plato was a big influence in evolutionary thinking. And here we have something of his, really the forerunner, foreshadowing the whole thing about eugenics. Now, before Charles Darwin came and uh, wrote his books, 
basically our Western culture before then had been very much uh, influenced by Christian understanding. The Christians understood from their Bible that, that human beings were made in the image of God. Therefore, people should be respected, um, irrespective of colour or whatever. And in fact, the, the early church councils, there were a whole variety of different nationalities represented amongst the bishops. And there, there was the, the command of Christ to take the message of, right through to all the ethnic groups. And here's uh, Augustine, who was one of the church leaders um, in the 5th century. He said, Whoever is anywhere born a man, no matter what unusual appearance or how peculiar in some part, they are human, descended from Adam. In other words, they're equally uh, valid before God, not a distinction as such. We get to Charles Darwin, and uh, his personal tutor at Cambridge University was Professor Adam Sedgwick. And after Sedgwick had uh, read Charles Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859, the same year he wrote this letter to, to Charles Darwin. There is a moral or metaphysical part of nature as well as physical. A man who denies this is deep in the mire of folly. It is the crown and glory of organic science that it does, through final cause, link material to moral. You have ignored this link. And if I do not mistake your meaning, you have done your best in one or two pregnant cases to break it. Were it possible, which thank God it is not, to break it, humanity in my mind would suffer a damage that might brutalise it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since its written records tell us of its history. A kind of a warning he was giving, almost prophetically, uh, to Charles Darwin himself. Charles Darwin, of course, uh, we tend to shorten it to the origin of the species, but it's actually a long, they, they like long titles in those days. Uh, but the part of it is preservation of favoured species and the struggle for life. And he understood that. Uh, and he also understood he was influenced to some extent by Malthus, uh, who had talked about mass extinctions in the past. Um, <clears throat> and he said in The Descent of Man, uh, later in 1871, but there appears to be at least one check in steady action, namely the weaker and inferior members of society not marrying so freely as the sound, and this check might be indefinitely increased. Now, he was not straight out right saying eugenics, but he was beginning to uh, point towards it. But he was very careful in some of the things he actually uh, spoke about publicly. He wrote another thing, The Centre of Man. I guess this was also very much influenced by Malthus. At some future point, period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilised races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, as Professor Schaffhausen has remarked, will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilised state, as we may hope, even than a Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now, between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. Basically, Darwin was a scientist. He liked very much the solitude of his research and everything else. He didn't really like the big public heated debate at times, but Huxley loved it, and he was that kind of man. So he was very much a spokesman for Charles Darwin. And he said in one of his speeches, No rational man... Cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior, of the white man. The highest places in the hierarchy of civilization will assuredly not be within the reach of our dusky cousins. The white man may wash his hands of it, and a Caucasian conscience be void of reproach for evermore. So his understanding, very popular at the time, was it was no way you'd ever get an African, for example, being a, a scientist or a research scientist or a professor of science or in politics and in a major way, or any kind of influence like that. That would just be completely out of the question. Herbert Spencer was the one that coined the phrase survive of the fittest at the time of Charles Darwin. And he said, the principle of survive of the fittest implies that people who are burdens on society should be allowed to die rather than be helped by society. We get now to Sir Francis Galton, who is the father of eugenics, um, recognise as such, and he was the cousin of Charles Darwin, and they spent quite a lot of time uh, discussing things. And he wrote this, I do not see why any insolence 
of caste should prevent the gifted class, when they had the power, from treating their lower caste com- compatriots with all kindness as long as they maintained celibacy. But if these continue to procreate children, inferior in moral, intellectual and physical qualities, it is easy to believe that the time may come when such persons would be considered enemies to the state and to have forfeited all claims of kindness. Very much echoes of Plato uh, a long time before. There's Leonard uh, Darwin. He was the son of Charles Darwin and he was the chairman of the Eugenic Society and very influential in this period. Um, and one of the things he said, he wrote a book called uh, Eugenic Reform in 1926 and he dedicates it to his father, Charles Darwin. He says, dedicated to the memory of my father, for if I had not believed that he would have wished me to give such a help as I could toward making his life's work of service to mankind, I should never have been led to write this book. He says again, in the same book, um, in considering whether any method of selecting the better types for multiplication or the worst types for elimination can from a practical basis for eugenics reform, those eugenicists who, like myself, are hoping to be able to utilise the methods which have been effective in organic evolution are inevitably led to consider that what guidance can be obtained from a study of the action of natural selection. In other words, his Bible, as it were, was Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. They had to work out, in evolution had to permeate every aspect of society, including social evolution, uh, and working it out based on the fundamentals of Charles Darwin. He also says uh, in his birth control review, of all the problems which will have to be faced in the future, in my opinion, the most difficult will be those concerning the treatment of the inferior races of mankind. Now, let's get to the German evolution and eugenics. You see, <clears throat> there came a point both in America um, and other parts, Sweden, other parts of Europe, where sterilisation took place. Uh, so people who were regarded as being unfit, uh, they were sterilised so they couldn't have children. There were tens of thousands of them. In Germany, I think something like 375,000 were sterilised. But it was on German soil that the ideas of evolution really took off, and especially with uh, eugenics. Charles Darwin himself, in a letter, he said he was very excited because he said, the support which I receive from Germany is my chief ground for hoping that our, our views will ultimately prevail. So he was very, very excited about that. And here's an interesting one. His cousin, a letter from Francis Galton to his niece, Millie, in, um, which was in 1909, but he says, a eugenics review under the title of Rassen Hygiene has been started in Munich by a very capable man, Dr. Plertz, who is the editor of a really solid anthropological periodical. The society that issues the review has five honorary members among whom are Heichel and Weissmann, and I'm asked to be an honorary vice president, which, I, which honour I have gladly accepted. In other words, Francis Galton, the father of uh, eugenics, was the vice president of the first, what was called the, um, the, the racial or race hygiene, uh, which was the eugenics German version of what was happening in, in Britain and America. And it was established, and uh, Francis Galton, as I said, was the honorary vice president for it and really excited about what the Germans were doing. So who was uh, Professor Alfred Plertz? Well... He became the director of the German uh, Society for Race Hygiene um, uh, at this particular time, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, highly regarded um, in Germany and abroad. He said, the hygiene of the entire human species co- coincides with that of the Aryan race, which represents a civilised race par excellence. To further it, that is the Aryan race, is the same as furthering all of humanity. And uh, Francis Galton, Galton, in a letter to Alfred Ploetz, personally said, we take the highest interest in your eminent and important eugenics. So he was really, really right behind what was happening in those days of, in early days in Germany. One of the people that uh, Francis Galton mentioned was Professor Ernest Heichel, who was a zoologist. Um, and he was interesting, a very, very staunch evolutionist, but he was also a pantheist. 
And he believed in a consciousness that went through everything. Do you remember I remember traced through in the first part of my talk about you had evolution coming through from a sort of a Brahmin root and it branched two ways. You had the pantheistic, that was a Pythagoras uh, kind of characters through, uh, right through those, those people. And then you had, you had the naturalist, that was Thales and Epicurus and Democritus and so on. So you had the same root for both, but they seemed to be very separate, but the, they were rooted the same way. But here we have Heichel, and he wasn't the only one because he set up the, uh, the Monist League in 1906 and there were something like 60,000 members. And many of them were leading scientists in Germany uh, who were pantheists. There was a revival of, like very much we see like New Age and pagan ideas we see in our culture today. Alongside the same time, I, mean, I don't know if you went up at, to uh, Samhain, well, another name for Halloween, on the Royal Mile on Wednesday, but you had a whole lot of people, revival of pagan stuff going on there and processions and so on. So there was this kind of thing going on in Germany, side by side, evolution and revival of pagan ideas. And Heichel said pantheism is the world system of the modern scientist. Pantheism is only a polite form of atheism. Uh, Einstein, for example, was a pantheist, very much in the line of Spinoza, uh, the same kind of idea. Now, here's an interesting thing because he's probably better, he's quite well known, I think, for, for what he called the recapitulation theory. And he basically uh, was convinced that in the womb uh, you would have this progression of evolutionary process from the simpler forms through to the more complex forms in, in the human, in, in, uh, right up to the human being. The sad thing was, I mean, he did some great drawings, he was a very good artist, but he actually um, was caught out being a bit fraudulent with some of his diagrams, and it was not actually accurate. If you look at the one on the left-hand side, that's his... Um, his diagrams. But you can look on the right-hand side, you see the actual photographs. You actually see up-to-date analysis of what they really look like, and actually very, very different indeed. So Heichel was completely wrong in his understanding of that. Um, he hoped very much to find um, a transitional form, um, common ancestor through to humans, called uh, Pithecanthropus allulus. And um, it never emerged. That was a friend, I think, did the painting for him. And uh, he told his students that if they get, went off to Indonesia, they would eventually find what he was looking for. In fact, they did. In fact, it was Eugene Dubois who found uh, what was called the Java Man. And it was debated back and forth over it. Uh, was it transitional form? Then it was a gibbon. It turned out, I think, I think it was just a Homo erectus, which is fully human. But here's something about Heichel, his quote. He said, It's impossible to want to plant human education, that is, amongst African and Asian tribes, where the necessary ground for it, human brain development, is lacking. They have scarcely elevated themselves above that lower stage of transition from the anthropoid apes and, and ape men. So again, it's very typical of that period uh, that it would just be impossible to be able to educate uh, some of the African and Asian tribes because they weren't evolved enough. Let's move on now. It progresses through to ethnic cleansing. There was a man, uh, he was a French sociologist, uh, Lapouge, in 1887. And he said, he predicted this, in the next century, that would be for the 1900s, people will be slaughtered by the millions for the sake of one or two degrees on the Catholic index, that is the cranial measurement popular with anthrop anthropologists, because uh, they measured it by the brain and the skull and so forth. The superior races will substitute themselves by force for the human groups retarded in evolution. And the last sentimentalists, whoever they are, I suppose are regarded as human beings as all being equal in the eyes of God, will witness the copious extermination of entire peoples. How accurate he was in his prediction. He could see how things were going. And in fact, <clears throat> it began to escalate because of evolutionary thinking uh, in the education system right through and what was called the Herero Massacre. Now, this was in South... It used to be called uh, South West Africa. Uh, it became known later as Namibia. And it was a time of colonialists pushing uh, and ransacking, going in and taking resources, wh whatever they wanted from Africa. And the Europeans were doing it. You know, move over Africans, it's ours. 
And uh, after the Conference of Berlin 1885, uh, Africa was carved up amongst different nations, and Germany got uh, southwestern um, Africa, or Namibia as it's called now. And there was this tribe called the Herero. Now, they got fed up because the Germans treated them like dirt, basically, because they, they raped the women, they, they murdered the men for no real reason, often, uh, beat them to death for small offences. And this chap was sent by uh, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II to sort them out. And uh, General Lothar von Trotter, the rotter. And off he went, and he said, I believe that the Herero nation as such should be exterminated. The exercise of violence and crass terrorism and even gruesomeness was and is my policy. I destroy the African tribes with streams of blood and streams of money. Only following this cleansing can something new emerge which will remain. In other words, get rid of this stuff. This is what Malthus has been talking about. This is what we need to do. We need to uh, clear out the path so we can have something uh, better that will emerge out of the chaos. Professor Eugene Fisher was regarded very much as being a sort of father of German genetics, really, um, a leading scientist at that time. And he went off to study uh, the Herero tribe that were massacred. And the heads had been chopped off and everything. He examined the skulls. He sent them off for, for uh, laboratory examination in Germany. And um, he became very influential. In fact, the German government rewarded him as director of eugenics at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology. Later on, he co-wrote The Principles of Human Heredity and Race Hygiene, 1921, with professors Edwin Bauer and Fritz Lenz. Uh, it became the university textbook on eugenics in Germany. And this, when Hitler was in prison, he read and had a big influence on his life. And later on, Hitler actually promoted him to the rector of the University of Berlin, where he taught eugenics to Nazi doctors. So we can see how this begins to grow. Let's just look at an Englishman, H.G. Wells, better known for the Time Machine and War of the Worlds and uh, science fiction books. Nevertheless, he was a very, very staunch evolutionist and eugenicist. He wrote, There is only one sane and logical thing to be done with a really inferior race, and that is to exterminate it. Uh, and again, he said, The elites of the future will kill off the diseased, ill-formed or unintelligent members of the human race. So it wasn't just the uh, unevolved races, but it was also those who were sick amongst us. Those who were... Uh, uh, genetically not up to it. They were unfit. And that could be every, anything. It could include the elderly. Uh, I suppose you could kill off people with cancer too. And there's a whole lot of other people as well. And then we get to Adolf Hitler uh, and right-wing socialism, the National Socialist Party. Now, a lot of people think about Hitler. He was a complete nutter who just suddenly appeared and he did some good things. He I think the VW Beetle boat, uh, car and the roads and the Autobahn and all the rest of it. And uh, my wife's German, by the way, and um, she told me about some good things that Hitler did. Um, but nevertheless, we tend to think about Hitler as being a pretty nasty character. But you have to bear in mind he was a product of his age. He was surrounded by a committee of leading scientists who were staunch evolutionists and eugenicists. He had been influenced uh, by a number of these scientists in his readings and, and research. Yes, there were occult influences. If you look at the, the uh, swastika flag behind uh, him, there, everywhere they went, they took the swastika. It was uh, taken from a Hindu symbol. It was an Aryan, uh, Aryan supremacy, because in the Hindu understanding, we trace it right back again, uh, you had the Aryan with the supreme white, the white caste, and then down through the, the, the skin's colour, right down to the black skin, they were the lowest, they were the sudra. So <clears throat> there was this, this, this greatly highly evolved race, the Aryan white-skinned people, and he actually honestly thought that they were doing a wonderful thing uh, to do what they did. And uh, this sign, this swastika, actually means well-being, translated from the Sanskrit uh, swastika, and it means well-being. So basically, it's another way of saying eugenics. We are out to do a wonderful thing. We want to see uh, the world evolve. We understand evolution, and we want to, to work it through in a social way. So he said, man must pass through many further stages of metamorphosis, 
All creative forces will be concentrated in a new species. The, the two types of man, the old and the new, will evolve rapidly in different directions. One will disappear from the face of the earth, the other will flourish. This is the real motive behind the National Socialist Movement. By the way, just mentioning too, is Hitler's bedtime reading was a book by Blavatsky called The Secret Doctrine. It was an occult book. She was a leading spiritualist and one of the forerunners of what you call the New Age movement these days. But in his copy, he'd written many notes uh, in the margins. He was very influenced by occult understanding. But Blavatsky, too, um, spoke about this Aryan supremacy and this evolutionary process. So, again, the two things were coming together. She was coming very much through an Indian Hindu Brahmin way of understanding, through a Gnostic tradition. She was a leading Freemason, except amongst the, the Eastern Lodge, which is the women's uh, thing. And so you had that as well behind it, side by side. And, of course, we know the history of the, well, 6 million Jews, but uh, 11 million people who were uh, exterminated, um, just a couple of... Horrible pictures. Then we look at uh, Karl Marx. Now, he, of course, was... That was Marxism, that was left-wing socialism. And, of course, uh, Nazism and uh, uh, Marxism, socialism, communism, they were, they, they were at each other's throats later on. But here we go. He said, Although developed in a coarse English manner, this is the book, i.e. the Origin of Species, that contains the foundation and natural history for our view. That was a letter to his uh, real, uh, friend Friedrich uh, Engels uh, in 1860. That was just after he had read uh, Darwin's Origin of Species. And uh, Engels himself said, Just as Darwin discovered the law of evolution in organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of evolution in human history. So it's just following through, really. Leon Trotsky later on said, Darwin stood for me like a mighty doorkeeper at the entrance to the temple of the universe. Later on we have Lenin and Stalin. And in a time of terrible suppression, as communism uh, began to spread, with the millions of lives that anybody, intellectuals, anybody who was in opposition to it, was eliminated uh, by the millions. And then, of course, there was the Asian version of it uh, with Mao Zedong. Um, the Cultural Revolution, again with uh, tens of millions of people who were exterminated. And uh, Pol Pot, of course, in um, Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge more recently, um, and uh, what was called the Killing Fields, pretty horrendous too. Uh, a few million people there were liquidated. There's a chap called Dr. Hendrik uh, Vo. Vo- Wurud, I don't know how to pronounce that, architect of Ar- 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 apartheid. Now, he went over, he um, was very much in studying psychology, but he actually went over to Germany and studied at Hamburg and other uh, German universities. He was very much influenced um, by his, the understanding of eugenics uh, at the time. And um, he came back to South Africa, eventually became prime minister. And uh, apartheid became really was sort of framed and developed uh, very largely through what happened uh, with him. And as we know, all the it's not so long ago, we had that uh, problem, still to some extent do. Rwandan massacres, that is more recent, uh, horrendous. I think there were probably about a million people, like 800,000 or something that were slaughtered or some, something like that. But um, that was pretty horrible. Um, you know, not, not so long ago. Now, the, the Hutu and Tutsi were two tribes. Um, the Tutsi beforehand, going back a long time ago, they tended to be the ruling class. Uh, and the Hutu were the majority. And they were sort of more of a servant class. So they already had that tribal sort of tension beforehand. But what happened was, um, uh, first of all, Germany had an influence in Rwanda. And uh, followed by... The Belgians coming in, and the Belgians actually differentiated between the Hutsi and the Tutsi, not so much on their cultural history, but on the basis of evolutionary understanding, so that cards were issued uh, for each one, Um, and oppression came. The the Belgians rewarded the Tutsi minority with places in, in government or places of authority and so forth, and the Hutu majority eventually 
and had enough. And uh, it broke out in civil war. We know the results of that. So that was an influence there. Well, let's have a look at the sexual revolution. Um, time of, yeah. You have to bear in mind, in that same particular period I was talking about, 19th century through the early 20th century, evolution had become so essentially uh, regarded as a scientific foundation, therefore everything had to be influenced by it. So you had leading uh, professors of philosophy and ethics and so on um, were beginning to redefine morality and ethics. So here's a quotation from Professor Friedrich Jodl uh, from University of Vienna. And he said, morality too is a product of evolution, as in, in a state of continual transformation. Professor Arnold Dodel said, the new world view actually rests on the theory of evolution. On it we have to construct a new ethics, which of course included sexuality. In fact, a lot of them in Germany and America and Britain and Europe were debating uh, leading academics, uh, let's redefine sexuality. So some were saying... Polygamy is fine, you know, you can have as many wives as you want. Or adultery, let's redefine it. Or um, same-sex uh, relationships, or whatever. There's a whole variety of different things were being discussed and opened up uh, in that particular time. Well, it really um, breaks open with Dr. Alfred Kinsey. And um, he was a zoologist. He'd actually studied uh, gall wasps and got his PhD on that. And uh, later on, he took an interest in human sexuality. He became a professor at Indiana University, and he was given permission to do research on human sexuality. And a lot of people regarded him as the, really, the sort of the pioneer of what we call the sexual revolution. And so you see that picture on the right-hand side with this, um, another book by somebody else. What can you learn from the Kinsey Report? And there's a woman saying, oh, my goodness, you know, all these things we learn, we never knew about. It's all been suppressed, and that's all out in the open now. And um, the time of Kinsey. So, some of the things that Kinsey's... Uh, he wrote Mail Report, his research, had a team of researchers, which produced the, the Mail Report of, uh, from children right through to older men, um, something like 5,300 of them, uh, interviewing them. And that was 1948, and then the female report um, in 1953. This was for America. So his conclusions were, from his research, 50% of men have extramarital affairs. 29% of women have extramarital affairs. 30%, 37% of men have had at least one homosexual experience. 10% of men are exclusively homosexual. 6% of the population is exclusively heterosexual. Premarital sex is good for you. And we should express ourselves sexually in any way we like, provided it's mutual. Uh, and we need to cast off religious and cultural inhibitions that, which are so harmful. In other words, if we got rid of those, the, the old-fashioned sort of Christian ideas or something, we got rid of that idea of guilt and everything and that suppression, uh, we're free from that. We wouldn't feel uh, it was bad at all about anything like this. And um, that was basically summed up a lot of his results. Well, he was somebody who was very, very happy about it. He's got a big smug smile. I think he's 81 now. Um, Hugh Hefner, who came up with uh, Playboy, uh, the uh, pornographic magazine. And he said, we believe we are filling a publishing need only slightly less important than the one just taken care of by the Kinsey Report. He obviously said that when he was younger. Uh, and that was in the first issue of Playboy. Well, as things developed... Um, uh, Kinsey's reports became the foundation for sexuality. And uh, one person, Dr. Mary Calderon, was, uh, she was nicknamed the High Priestess of Sex Education. Um, she became a professor, uh, associate professor at New York University. But beforehand, she'd been a former medical director of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Uh, she co-founded uh, SECUS, which is Sex Information Education Council of the United States, with Professor Lester Kirkendall, who was the head of Department of Family Life at Oregon State University. Now, Kirkendall mentored Professor Derek Calderwood, who became the head of the New York State Education Department in 1970. 
Calderwood there, uh, in uh, developing of a degree in human sexuality, included things like nude workshops, body, nude body workshops, um, which meant students exploring each other, uh, each other's sexual bits, uh, both men with each other, women with each other, men with women. That was part of the, the training um, of that type of thing. Now, Dr. Walder Pomeroy was one of Kinsey's fellow researchers, very influential chap, and he was a founding member of this uh, CECUS. Now, some of the things, statements that have come out of CECUS are as such back in 1980. Rational understanding and acceptance of the wide range of possible expressions of sexuality constitute one goal of education for sexuality. In other words, it's very important that people are liberated to express themselves however they wish. Another one. A child's sexuality should be developed in the same way as a child's inborn human capacity to, to talk or to walk, and the parent's role should relate only to teaching a child the appropriateness of privacy, place and person, in a word, socialisation. In other words, the parent's role is simply that the children should only do sexual exploration, whatever they wanted to do, in the right place at the right time, um, and obviously the, uh, the right person too, but there was a real sense of trying to bring freedom to the child to explore these type of things. There came a spate in the 80s of sex education books for adolescents with children. One was Boys and, Boys and Sex, Girls and Sex by Dr. Wardle Pomeroy. It was one of Kinsey's co-researchers. And it was advice for over 11s, uh, detailing sexual description for them to try out all sorts of sexual intercourse positions and various other things, what to do. He, he regarded it, he advised them, it's like taking a car out on a test run before you buy it. In other words, try out all these things as you go through life before you eventually settle down with somebody you really like. Um, 1986, another book came out which had a big influence in, in America, Learning About Sex, The Contemporary Guide for Young Adults by Gary Kelly. It was voted onto the best books list for young adults by the American Library Association and highly recommended by Professor Calderon, that was, that was uh, Mary, um, who was sort of co-founded Secus. It contains encouragement for premarital sex, homosexual, lesbian sex, bestiality, that's sex with animals, and adultery um, or extra, extramarital sex as being quite normal. Something which shocked people back in the 80s was the uh, North American Man-Boy Love Association, quotation from one of their conferences, Children must have unhindered right to have sex with members of any set age of the same or opposite sex. Now, let's look at actually Kinsey's uh, methods of collecting data. We've seen something of the progress progression of where it's going. But let's see how Kinsey actually got his data. And here was a warning by Dr. Abraham Maslow, who was a leading psych psychologist uh, and was friends to begin with, uh, with Kenzie, but they, they had disagreements. And it was over this. This is a letter he wrote to a friend. When I warned him, that's Kinsey, about volunteer error, he disagreed with me and was sure his random selection would be OK. As I expected, the volunteer error was proven and the whole basis for Kinsey's statistics was proven to be shaky. All my work was excluded from his bibliography. In other words, what he was saying was this. Kinsey was basically... He wanted to home in on certain categories of people, and I'll, find, I'll show you a bit later, and then they would get the volunteer. They would actually collect the people. They'd invite their friends, and from that, he would get his statistics. Um, so what did he do, uh, Kinsey and his team? Well, of the 5,300 males, he interviewed 1,400 who were sex offenders in prison. Um, in other words, that's about 25%, I think, of the male interviewees were in for sexual, sexual offence, um, in prison for it, which is rather a, a large percentage. Uh, he excluded, for example, majority, bear in mind this is America in the 1940s and 50s, and that's sort of period where it was very sort of Bible Belt, uh, right-wing, sort of Christian-based for most people. And he deliberately avoided most of that. And he, he, he homed in on uh, other groups. 
for his data collecting. So, there were 32 contact groups. Seven groups were male prostitutes. Uh, it records male, in his male report, there were several hundred of them, male prostitutes. There were pimps, prisoners, and criminals uh, amongst these seven groups. And, of course, they then collected, introduced their friends for inter- to be interviewed. Um, the contacts who were interviewed were also pre-primed because they said, we always assume that everyone has engaged in every type of activity. That was an assumption from Kinsey uh, and his team that every human being, uh, particularly in the male report we're talking about, all males have experienced everything. That was his assumption. There was one senior high school, uh, Woodrolf uh, Senior High School in uh, Peoria in, in Illinois, um, Illinois rather, it was chosen and it was known to be particularly high in the percentage of people who were dabbling or involved with homosexual activity. Very unusual high percentage. But there was one person who managed to get 350 reports from students there without permission of parents or of the school until he was found and he was thrown out. Of the uh, data on children, there's research on 375 children from the age of two months through to 15 years old. There were technically trained experts which were used to bring children to climax. That's uh, mentioned in the Mayor Report, Chapter 5. One of these technically trained experts uh, claimed he had had sexual relationships with 600 boys, 200 girls, sexual intercourse with countless adults of both sexes, with animals of many species, 17 incest relationships and incest with his grandmother and father. And then uh, Pomeroy says, and this is the Institute for Sex Research, he said, the data here was a basis for a fair part of Chapter 5 in the male volume concerning child sexuality. Because of these elaborate records, we were able to get data on the behaviour of many children. In other words, a high, a high section of the report on this, uh, of children's sexuality, was based on one man who had had all this experience uh, with these... There's a lot of people, actually, add them all up. Probably well over a thousand by the time he's gone through all that. So that was one of the main, and obviously very keen to, whether he was exaggerated, whether he was lying, we don't know. But certainly they took it down. It was a great influence in their research. Pomeroy, bear in mind, he was an associate researcher with Kinsey. He said, incest between adults and younger children can also prove to be a satisfying and enriching experience when there is a mutual and unselfish concern for the other person. When we look at Kinsey and the homosexual statistics, he said that 10% of males are homosexual. But you have to bear in mind, when he was doing his research in those days, he was taking his statistics from people, many of them were uh, practicing homosexuals. Um, He himself was bisexual. And so there was a bias written into his whole understanding at the beginning. But more recent research... Um, this is from the University of Chicago in 2001, says the real figure for uh, active homosexual, exclusive homosexuals would be about 1.5%. But you have to bear in mind, this is 2001 um, rather than 1948. Now, 1948, um, people uh, were not so widely, you know, it's, it's almost like if something becomes normal, acceptable, and it's advertised on television and everything else, then it becomes more acceptable, so more people try it. So there should actually be a higher percentage than in the time of Kinsey. Now, let's have a look at something about the side effects or the result or the fruit of the sexual revolution. What I call sowing the wind. Uh, I call it sowing the wind because I see it as not being a really uh, objective scientific investigation. Sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. In 1900, the percentage of illegitimacy was about 1%. 2006, last year, illegitimacy, 60%. 1920, the divorce rate was below 17%. 2006, divorce rate above 50%. Broken homes means broken lives. So we have an increase uh, 
and to 2006, 63% of teen suicides, this is what the psychologists say, have come from broken homes. And all this list here are the percentages from broken homes. 71% from broken homes, high school dropouts. 75% children in chemical abuse centres. 80% rapists. 85% youth offenders in prison. 85% children with behavioural problems. 90% runaways and homeless children. That is a huge increase. Um, Very, very worrying. Let's just look briefly at sexually transmitted diseases. One uh, leading expert in the British Medical Journal said, The sexually permissive section in our society shows little but ignorance, indifference or contempt for the venereal diseases. We venerologists wonder what can be done to contain them as they threaten to get out of hand. We wonder how high our graphs will climb. So I've got these ones. And uh, I've not got the most up-to-date um, information on this, um, so sort of running out of time towards the end, but these are ones taken mostly from about 1990, and of course there would have been there'd be more since 1990. But herpes is one of the common diseases, and bear in mind there are about 60 sexually transmitted diseases, and I'm just going through a few of them. Herpes, um, over 25 million people infected in America uh, in 1990, Unfortunately, at least 50% of babies born to infected mothers will die or suffer uh, neurological damage. Chlamydia. 30 to 50% of babies born suffer from eye infections or, in many cases, pneumonia. <laughs> Cost in 1990 of treatment uh, for chlamydia was $1.3 billion. PID, or pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, half a million new cases every year. 60,000 women infertile as a result. 90,000 women suffer chronic abdominal, abdominal pain and pain sexually it affects the uh, sexual enjoyment. Cost of over $1 billion 17 years ago. Cervical cancer, mostly caused through pre extramarital uh, sex. Not in every case, but majority uh, is, is uh, cervical cancer through that kind of sex. 12 million sufferers in the United States alone. 750,000 new ones every year. In Britain, I just recently, I don't know whether you've been following the news, the, the talk about vaccinating schoolgirls in, in uh, Britain, a uh, cost of £1.4 billion pounds over the next 10 years, up to that sort of price. AIDS, well, we know, of course, about AIDS. Um, it's absolutely rife in Africa and so on, but um, here, or oh, America rather, uh, in 1989, they reckoned to be 1.5 million sufferers of AIDS in America. 1992, 60,000 had died. 40% of babies on average, uh, if their mother has got AIDS, will be infected uh, and most of them die. 2006, the cost in, in uh, America was £22 billion. Pounds. I would like to say, uh, in conclusion, eugenics was a movement driven by evolution as a philosophy and not by real science and caused untold carnage to the lives of hundreds of millions of people. I'd also like to say that Kinsey's sexual revolution was based on a biased agenda of evolution and not on real science and it has equally caused carnage to many millions and the cost of this experiment must be in the realm of hundreds of billions of pounds. If you put together not just sex, treating sexually transmitted diseases, but people in hospital, treatment, AIDS victims, and so on, then you put together all that high percentage I put down of broken homes, uh, of prison, uh, of, of you know looking up people in prison. I know one person, for example, runs a home, residential home, just for four teenage girls, four of the most difficult ones, just four of them. Costs about half a million pounds a year to look after four. Uh, come from broken homes and uh, they've been brought up have sex with anybody you want kind of thing um, and uh, sometimes they've even had boys <laughs> coming in through the windows and had to k- kick them out and so on so that is just one example so if you put it all together 
uh, including the whole drugs industry, which is about, in America, I think it was about $250, $260 billion. Uh, You add that all together, you're probably talking about hundreds, not thousands, certainly hundreds of billions of dollars for a whole lot of stuff and uh, all that goes on with the society. So, my last part is this. I believe it's time, time to rethink in our culture. And I just want to read to you at the end something from Romans, chapter 1 of the Bible, which says, it's the Apostle Paul saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Therefore God also gave them over to uncleanness, in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonour their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Thank you very much.